When war is ramping up, that's when you have to be most attentive to propaganda attempts, propaganda campaigns, efforts to present a certain narrative to beguile you or propagandize you into supporting the latest war effort. <clears throat> and one narrative you be you see being propounded right now is that none of the millions of people who are on the streets in Iran mourning the assassination of Soleimani are there on their own free will. They've all been manipulated or coerced by the regime into getting out in the public square and manifesting their condolences of the slain leader. Now, are there certain benefits to in Iran going out and participating in a public morning event like this? Yeah, you get some free transportation here and there. You get maybe time off from work. But do we think that there is not a genuine sentiment in Iran, which is obviously genuinely mournful of the assassination of this individual and resentful of the country which perpetrated the assassination, the United States? Do you really think millions of people would be turning out unless there was something authentic about their opposition to what Occur, just use the Occam's razor, people. Occam's razor is take the simplest explanation because that's usually the most applicable explanation. And if you watch this, the footage, or you read the reports, or you follow the coverage of the public morning events today, you'll, I think, pretty quickly ascertain that there is a widespread, genuine antipathy being expressed for this assassination. Think about it this way. If the current Secretary of State was assassinated in the U.S., and again, Soleimani isn't really even a proper analog to the Secretary of State because he's in many ways a much more pow powerful figure in the context of, the, uh, of Iran than the Secretary of State would be, but somebody analogous to that. If they were assassinated, by a country, foreign country perceived to be hostile, I think you'd have a lot of people rallying to the defense of the U.S. government because even if half of the country does not like this current Secretary of State, they also don't want him to be assassinated or they do not accept that kind of foreign meddling in our affairs. And that's an obvious dynamic underway in Iran. You're hearing reports now that even factions which are regarded as reformist are hostile to the Iranian government, which their grievances would be legitimate if they oppose the Iranian government in many respects. But even they are outraged about this attack by the U.S. and vowing revenge. Even the leaders associated with the government of Iran prior to 1979 who were deposed in a revolution by the current regime. I don't even like to use the word regime because it's just inherently pejorative and it's not applied equitably across the spectrum, but even forces that were literally deposed by the current regime in 1979, they're coming out and praising Soleimani essentially as a national hero. So if your idea is to topple the Iranian government or to delegitimize it, then assassinating one of its key figures, if not the key figure, in this fashion is probably the worst way to go about it because it just rehardens the resolve of the factions that are pro-government in Iran and brings people who might otherwise be skeptical or have criticisms of the government into the fold and essentially unites differing sections of Iran, just as would likely happen in the case of the U.S. if something similar happened here.
think of how united the country was, for example, in the wake of 9-11. I'm not saying this is quite analogous to 9-11, but I'm saying that when the country feels that as though it's been attacked, the natural response is toward unity in favor of the government and opposition to whatever force is responsible for committing the attack, and that's not Trump. So you have like uh, State Department people on Twitter, um, as well as their sort of right wing boosters propping up this idea that the street mobilizations in Iran, which are the largest, at least in 30 years since the death of Khomeini in 1989, and perhaps even going back further than that, they're telling you that this is all inorganic or it's all coerced because Iran is a dictatorship. Well, you don't have to praise every aspect of the Iranian government. You can even want, theoretically, a brand new government to recognize that, yes, it's 100% predictable that there would be a rallying around the flag response in the wake of such a dramatic assassination like this. Now, I don't know what you're seeing in your social media feeds or in your discussions with people, but I am overwhelmingly getting the impression, save for a handful of exceptions, that the people who otherwise operate under the banner of MAGA or are pro-Trump are rapturously in favor of what's occurring here. Even though it all but guarantees more U.S. engagement in the Middle East. That was, if not the intention... The result, and there's a good good reason to believe that, that actually was the intention, because if you commit a blatant act of war like this, you know that there's going to be a response. The Iranian government is not going to look out on all the millions of people who are demanding revenge and simply not do anything in response. Otherwise, they will lose their legitimacy. So they need to respond just as Americans would demand that we needed to respond if something analogous happened to one of our top military commanders or, or revered national heroes. So when you are being told that everybody out on the streets in Iran, the millions of people have been coerced into it or, or not acting on their own free will, you're being called to believe that these people all secretly like the fact that America, with whom they perceive themselves to be in armed struggle, they all like the fact that America assassinated their top military commander and national hero who defends Iran, maybe not using tactics that are always virtuous, in fact, not the case. Um, <laughs> I don't know, some music just turned on in my room. I have no idea where that's coming from. So give me one moment. Sorry about that. Clock radio, I guess. I don't know why. Uh, I guess it's noon now, so it went off at noon for whatever reason. Anyway, I lost my train of thought. Um, I thought maybe my uh, my room was being tapped by, you know, musical, I don't know, Russian bots or 
pro-Trump people who are resentful of the fact that I'm now refuting militaristic propaganda that they like. So the pro-Trump people generally liked when I refuted the militaristic propaganda as it related to Russiagate and as it related to the impeachment farce. Um, but when they're the ones promoting and parroting militaristic propaganda as it relates to this manufactured Iran crisis, they get super mad, which tells you that they don't really care about militaristic propaganda per se. They only care about it if it undermines their favorite political figure, which is not uh, surprising. That's just how partisans, partisanism or sorry, partisanship and tribalism work. Uh, but that's a tendency that I think should be counteracted by people who like to believe that they are rational. Because, for example, it's not rational to assert that there's some 46-dimensional chess move going on right now, and the grand uh, plan is to use this as a pretext to withdraw entirely from the Middle East, because that's not what any administration official, including Trump himself, say that they are doing. In fact, Trump said yesterday that he would refuse to comply with the expulsion order from the Iraqi parliament unless Iraq pays essentially a bribe of billions of dollars to compensate the U.S. for the bases that it has set up there. And do you think Trump is really going to accept being perceived as a weakling who retreated in the face of dissension from the Iraqi parliament? I tend to doubt it. In fact, part of the reason why Trump apparently went forward with this assassination action is because he was annoyed that when he declined to launch airstrikes against Iran last June, apparently some of the media criticized him as exhibiting weakness. So while, of course, I do blame Trump personally for giving this incredibly reckless and potentially catastrophic order, you also, in a way, have to blame the wider political and media environment, which consistently incentivizes this idea that the optimal way of projecting strength through the vehicle of American statecraft is to drop bombs and to impose crippling sanctions and to even at times launch totally insane wars. Remember, the best press coverage Trump really ever got, maybe throughout his entire presidency, was in April 2017 and again in April of 2018 when he bombed Syria, when he bombed targets in Syria associated with the Assad government. That's when pundits went on normally Trump hostile venues like, of course, MSNBC and declare that this is the night that Donald Trump became president. This is when he's really showed us that he has what it takes. So those are the incentives operative in American political culture. And that doesn't necessarily, that doesn't, that didn't start with Trump. It well predates Trump, but it does create a set of incentives where insane lunatic behavior like this is perceived as a potential political benefit. Um, and I don't know what precisely Trump is thinking, but I can listen to what his surrogates like Mike Pompeo were saying when he was on Face the Nation yesterday. Pompeo was asked to force about the Iran strike and he was pressed by Margaret Brennan on whether this, there was actually an imminent threat that the strike was ordered to forestall because that's what we were told occurred. Right, that they needed to launch this assassination or else imminent strikes or attacks would be carried out against U.S. targets. But Pompeo provided no evidence of the fact that there was an imminent attack being planned and basically just reverted to a long-standing criticism that he and the neocon ideologues around him have pushed for years, if not decades, that Iran is always trying to attack U.S. troops. So the assassination of Soleimani would have been justified at any time, maybe over the past, I don't know, 15 years, and they just chose now. So whether there was imminent threat is immaterial because Pompeo essentially divulged that this was a fundamentally an ideological assassination. 
meaning that there was a well-established political motive uh, behind it, and it wasn't strictly to uh, neutralize any threat. Uh, it was something that was being advocated all along. In fact, there has been reporting now in the Washington Post that Pompeo has been lobbying Trump to take more aggressive action on Iran for months, and evidently Trump acceded to that. So I would describe Pompeo as by far the most dangerous member of the administration now, and I, I believe that's been the case ever since he made his seamless transition from CIA director to secretary of state in the spring of 2018 making Pompeo more dangerous than, say, a Bolton, who is no longer in the administration. But even when he was, Bolton's sort of cartoonish hawkishness rendered him less effective than a Pompeo who can more shrewdly work the lines of communication with Trump, probably better on better terms with Trump personally than Bolton, who had a reputation for being overly assertive and brash. And... Pompeo has a very similar agenda, obviously infused with a little more uh, a rapture awaiting evangelicalism. But Pompeo is fundamentally a neocon. Um, you can quibble with the definitional labels, like, for example, Bolton wasn't technically a neocon in the sense of a Paul Wolfowitz type, but he was a strong ally of the neocons from a more belligerently hawkish ideological starting point but it doesn't all matter all that much when you drill down because they all fundamentally agree on the necessity of perpetual u.s interventionism worldwide you know bombing campaigns and uh, regime change and when people tell me this isn't regime change i ask them so how is it not attempting to initiate regime change when you kill perhaps the key member of the entire regime. You're changing the composition of the regime. When you do that, if the entire government doesn't collapse tomorrow, it doesn't mean that this was a regime change effort. So you have this straw man often being erected that, oh, we, we're not in a state of war with Iran because the U.S. hasn't launched a full-scale ground invasion. Well, first of all, that's more likely than possibly ever right now. But even if it doesn't happen in the next couple of days or week or month or whatever, it doesn't change the fact that we're in a state of war with Iran. And the music on my clock radio here in the room just turned back on, and now it's off again. So there's uh, now it's back on, so there's something bizarre happening here. So... I um, hope you enjoy this comic relief as I go fiddle with the clock radio once again. So give me two seconds. Okay, so the CIA clearly took over my little hotel clock radio there and is screwing with me. And no, actually, the fact is, I think it was just set to come on at noon. And then the previous time I went to go turn off the music, I pressed the snooze button rather than the power off button. So I pressed the power off button. But I would rather believe that there is some CIA Russian Trump plot to interfere with my clock radio um what was i saying <laughs> oh so pompeo on this uh face the nation interview yesterday basically confirmed that the ultimate objective is to facilitate total regime change in iran now what form will that take we don't know yet full-scale ground invasion likely not at least in the short short term although again more likely than it has been any time probably since 1979 um, um, so uh, in saying that Pompeo confirmed that there is fundamentally an ideological 
objective behind what they're attempting to do here, which is overthrow the government of Iran and the whole imminent threat thing was a total joke and a pretext. Number one, there's still no evidence publicly presented that Soleimani even ordered these small scale, ultimately rather insignificant attack on the U.S. embassy in Baghdad in late December. And again, to call it an embassy is sort of a misnomer. It's almost a fortress. So them going to one of the side entrances or exits or like a, a path of egress and, you know, using a battering ram to knock down a door and spray some graffiti, you know, might be a little bit of an annoyance or inconvenience for the many, many U.S. personnel who are inside the fortress, but never really was a major or substantial threat to them. Um, and again, there's no evidence that Soleimani even ordered it. Why would he order such a feckless attack in the first place? Maybe he did. Maybe he's just that dumb. Maybe he defeated ISIS and then decided to just pitily uh, attack little side areas of an embassy out of nowhere. Uh, I guess it's possible, but there's not been no evidence presented for it. It's just government assertion. So when I ask for evidence and I have pro-Trump people or conservative Twitter users uh, sending me claims that have been unverified and unsubstantiated from government sources, I ask them, would you trust that unsubstantiated claim if it came from some FBI or CIA official who was saying that Trump colluded with Russia? No, I would hope not. I argued against such credulity for years in the context of Trump, Russia and impeachment and conservatives generally ate it all up. Uh, but now, uh, because it is going in a different direction, they're very eager to revert to their posture of credulity towards such information. <clears throat> um, so it's not inconsistent for me. There's nothing inconsistent for me here. Um, it's inconsistent for you if you feel that getting on a militaristic propaganda campaign um, is consistent with everything that you envisioned for the Trump presidency. If you happen to be watching this and you're a Trump supporter, uh, unless you want to just, you know, content yourself with the comfort of believing that there is some grander plan here to extricate the U.S. from the reason when no evidence suggests that, in fact, quite the opposite, as tens of thousands of troops have been sent to the Middle East since the summer and, and uh, after the Soleimani assassination, thousands more were sent. That seems like the polar opposite of extricating the U.S. from the Middle East. Actually, we're more aggressively establishing our presence there. And Trump now is you know going wa hog wild on Twitter threatening to destroy Iranian cultural sites. So he says that it's fair game for the U.S. to destroy, I don't know, they haven't specified the sites, but it's, I guess, plausible that they could include ancient civilizational landmarks that Trump is perfectly happy to destroy through air, aerial bombarding campaigns. And if you don't think that's escalatory behavior and rhetoric, then I don't know what world you're living in. I think you should step back and view this a little more rationally. Now, I have a lot of people who are, I guess, slightly pro-Trump or outwardly pro-Trump. They'll say, oh, you, got, you need to calm down, buddy. You need to relax, maybe watch some football, um, have a drink. You know, I don't disagree with the having a drink part, um, but my question to them is, why are you so calm about being closer to the precipice of full-scale catastrophic war in the Middle East than any time since 2003? Is that calming to you? Is that prospect making you rest easy? Um, not me, particularly, and I think that's a warranted response, and I actually think it's a shame and almost a disgrace that more people aren't animated about this. Now, should we be calm in the sense that we retain our fa rational faculties and attempt to 
dispassionately anal- uh, analyze the facts and claims before us? Of course. Uh, but this idea that you're a little bit weird if you're following the propaganda campaign and warning about its adverse consequences. No, I think not being agitated about that is itself weird. So even in this comment thread in the chat, you have people saying, we're not going to war. You numbskull, we are at war. There are gradations of states of war, right? So when, for example, the U.S. launched its totally ill-fated um, totally ill-fated uh, intervention in Libya. That wasn't a full-scale ground invasion, but it was a regime change effort to topple the government of Gaddafi, and it did so, and it ended up ended up with Gaddafi killed in the streets, the government collapsing, uh, militias taking over, and a uh, refugee crisis that uh, transformed. European and arguably American politics. So an act of war is a state of war, and an act of war is what Trump committed. So when you say that there's no war because there's no full-scale ground invasion, you're again arguing with the straw man. And you're also ignoring that a full-scale ground invasion is increasingly likely if we take Trump's threats seriously. If Trump just obliterates... Iranian cultural sites because there's retaliatory action against U.S. targets. That's going to take us even closer. So the point is that we're now in this escalatory fervor, which does amount to a state of war. I don't know how many times I have to explain that um, for people who just refuse to understand it, I again invoke the analogy of do you believe that the U.S. would be in a state of war if somebody akin to Soleimani were assassinated by a foreign government? If General Mattis or even a Mike Pompeo or somebody, again, there's no totally apt analogy to Soleimani necessarily, but if somebody of extremely high stature in the U.S. government who was revered widely was assassinated, do you think the U.S. would view itself as in a state of war with whoever committed that action? Of course it would. It would take less than two seconds for that to be proclaimed in every media and government uh, precinct. And that's exactly what Iranian uh, factions are proclaiming now. They're vowing revenge. They're waving the flag, uh, the red flag, (coughs) They're waving and hanging the red flag that uh, calls for war. Um, Every top government official was vowing retribution in Iran. So, I mean, what do you think is happening here? It's like people are living in this bizarro uh, imaginary fairy tale land where they refuse to reckon with what's actually unfolding. And um, if you don't like my attempts to cut through this propaganda and you know cover the democratic primary race and the almost in the context of the propaganda campaign obviously tulsi is one of the strongest voices against what's transpiring then you know don't watch my youtube don't follow my tr- tweets don't read my articles feel free to go elsewhere you can parrot whatever ben shapiro is splurging out um along with his merry band of neocons because they're really happy right now because their neocon agenda is being carried out by Trump, who campaigned at least nominally in ways against it in 2016. I ask you, Trump people, if you voted for him in the 2016 Republican primary, did you do that under the assumption that he'd basically be carrying forth every uh, loony Marco Rubio regime change initiative, uh, whether Venezuela or Iran? Um I don't know. I don't think that's what really most people assumed would be the case. I don't think they thought that the Lindsey Graham, John McCain foreign policy was the foreign policy that was really going to be dictating how the Trump administration governs. But sure enough, that's where we're at. And you can deny it. You can obfuscate about it. You can pretend that what's happening isn't happening. But that's not how my reality functions. And I'm going to apply the same 
analytical rigor uh, to the impeachment nonsense, to whatever offshoots of Russiagate nonsense manifest. And that's that. So um, it's up to you whether you feel like that's something you want to, to follow um, or not. Uh, I, I get it if you'd rather just retrench into your little partisan hole um, because that's the sentiment shared by many Americans as I learned the hard way dealing with Russiagate where liberals and even some leftists decided to exile me from their uh, little uh, cool kid club um, on account of my denigration of what turned out to be a total joke of a narrative. But nonetheless, because not enough people were rebutting it, it ended up transmuting into an impeachment folly, uh, which I think in a small way has made it more likely that Trump will be elected. Although, of course, that could be overridden by whatever fallout arises from this Iran, Iran stuff. We can't predict the future. Just have to take events as they come. I just don't think that there's any other country on Earth which could convince itself that assassinating another nation's top military commander and revealed uh, revered national hero is anything other than a blatant act of war. The fact that we have such a sweeping propaganda apparatus and capacity for self-delusion in the U.S. where lots and lots and lots of people don't understand this is a testament to, I would have to say, the declining empire that we happen to live in, uh, which it does remind me in a lot of ways of Rome. Um, most countries on Earth, if their government committed such an act, they would immediately understand its implications, or at least they wouldn't immediately be cowed by such blatantly nonsensical propaganda. But because in the U.S., Actions like this are so expected and not even that surprising to many people. We just sort of accept the premises underlying them and believe what our leaders say was the ostensible justification, even if down the line, lots of people suddenly claim they recognize that these interventions and regime changes and bombings were probably not the greatest thing. Uh, in the moment, they're so wrapped up in the emotional fervor of it that they just parrot the propaganda. So when you see Iranians on the streets chanting death to America, you can take personal offense to that as if they hate you individually and your family and your community and your American flag or whatever. But I think they're chanting death to America not because they're jealous of our wide variety of fast food options or because you know we can walk down the street and purchase any number of toiletry products, but because we keep violently intervening, intervening in their region, attempting to topple their government, crippling them with sanctions, launching cyber attacks on their national infrastructure, killing their scientists, blowing up their um, blowing up their infrastructure etc cetera, etc cetera, surrounding them with military bases invading and occupying their neighboring countries i think that is more likely the explanation for why they chant death to america they remember there that for example we literally overthrew their government in 1953 and if a, another country overthrew our government in 1953, I think our citizens would be taught to remember that and it would inform their actions and opinions vis-a-vis -vis us or vis-a-vis -vis whichever government perpetrated that. Um, so, you know, that's that's the latest propaganda update. Follow this stuff closely. Um, and also in the context of the Democratic primary race, Pete Buttigieg, for example, is just spouting a bunch of words that he hopes seem intelligent and nuanced, but really are just amount to obfuscation where he doesn't take a clear position on anything. He refused last uh, yesterday to describe the attack as an assassination. Um, whereas Tulsi uh, was asked 
by a journalist here in New Hampshire when I was there and saw it, um, whether she agrees that it was an assassination, she replied with a simple one word answer, which was yes. Um, uh, so uh, take close notice of people who, who are kind of uh, transmorphing in, uh, to propaganda spewers. Take a close look at which candidates are clear that they believe that this is a disaster and don't have to couch everything with a thousand different qualifiers um, because it's pretty darn important. I also think it's useful for Tulsi as she did last night at an event at Dartmouth um, in New Hampshire to talk about the underlying causes of why crises like this constantly break out. Uh, and she was talking about what she called the business of war, the military industrial complex, incentivizing nonstop intervention like this over and over again, even when you have a president who claimed to want to change course. Um, because if we don't get to the structural roots of why we're always in these crises, then we will never resolve the situation. And you have a total personification of the military complex in the form of Defense Secretary Mark Esper, who's also trying to sell you on the virtue of this engagement, who was previously literally the top lobbyist at Raytheon, one of the chief defense contractors in the country, which stands to profit directly from the onset of new hostilities with Iran. So if there's ever a more vulgar embodiment or personification of the military industrial complex i have not heard about it although arguably dick cheney would apply and i'm sure dick cheney and his ilk are running around wearing maga hats right now and they're really happy that trump has done what he's done so if those are who you welcome as your new coalition partners then more power to you but i'm going to rebuke that every step of the way and have no qualms or reservations about doing so. The ghost of John McCain, I'm sure, is looking down and smiling from his final resting place. And if he were around today, he'd also be donning the MAGA hat. Um, so those are the people now that the uh, you know uh, reflexively, mindlessly pro-Trump faction have feel have uh, lined up with, and um, they're taking the country down an even uh, more aggressive course by continuing the threats, continuing the escalation, and yes, continuing the state of war which we are currently in and which was initiated starkly by the assassination of Soleimani and of Trump carries for through on the threats that he's making uh it will get even uh worse and so i'll leave it there for now um thank you for listening to the stream and i will talk to you all later